But today's message is called Bear One Another's Burdens, and it's really from chapter 6, but we're going to kind of spend some moments here at the beginning to kind of recap where we've been and to understand how Galatians all ties together, mainly because there's a lot of times when we begin to look at books of Scripture, especially when we spend as much time in one as we have in this one, where we kind of forget what the point was in the beginning and why we started it to begin with. And I, I titled the whole series Grace and Peace, and it was because uh, we need to have the grace of God to have peace in our lives. We, we need to understand that, and Paul is trying to get that apart uh, to people in Galatians across to them so that they understand uh, that we need Christ and that we need the simple gospel and not the complex that we can sometimes tend to do. But it's called Bear One Another's Burdens. We began this series with a heavy emphasis on Paul's concern for Galatians to avoid the gospel plus, where we add on requirements, where we add on restrictions for people. I told you that one of the greatest novels in the 19th century was Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, and the letter to Galatians could be given a similar title as the tale of two gospels. There's Paul's tale, however, uh, which is more factual, less fictional, and he warns us that of the two gospels being heard in Galatia and still being heard today, there's only one gospel that's true. And we need to be careful what we listen to and what we allow into our lives. We talked about Judaizers, and these people taught that a Christian must also be live as a Jew. The law and works were still required. If you have ever read any commentary on the epistles, you've likely seen this word Judaizers, but it was basically a, a group of Jewish believers that came in and said, well, you must do the things of the law plus believe in Jesus Christ. He wanted us to understand that we didn't need to do that. We talked about the Jerusalem Council that ultimately came to the agreement that the law was no longer required. We talked about the agreement of Scripture. Here we find agreement among some differing books of the Bible. You have uh, Romans 12:2 that says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Not one that we follow the law, but that we allow the Spirit to transform our lives. In James 1, 19 through 27, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be a blessing in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. When you read those scriptures, sometimes we can think there's something we need to do. But the, but the point of these passages is not that. The main point really is uh, that we have something that comes out of our faith. When we believe in the person and work of Jesus Christ, it produces things in us. Now, there's a difference between us and those who do not have that. We're supposed to look different, talk different, sound different, but it's not an addition to the gospel. It's not adding what, to what Christ has done. It's allowing what Christ has done to work in and through us. I told you that the main point of Galatians really could be found in 2.16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. An important distinction here is to remember that faith has fruit, not faith is fruit. And what I mean by that is, is when we have genuine faith, it's going to produce things in us. 
Things are going to come out of us that look more and more like Christ, particularly as we yield ourselves more and more to the leading of the Spirit. Not that we do things to earn faith. We don't do things to earn what we have. I told you that the world bears a grudge to the gospel because the gospel condemns the religious wisdom of the world. Sometimes, even as believers, we have to be careful because the Word of God can even offend us because we get married to our religious tradition, and when it's challenged by the Word of God, we get offended by it. So we can see how that happens. We can see how the world gets, uh, bears a grudge against it because there are times where we do. The world bears the gospel a grudge and Martin Luther went on to state in his quote, jealous for its own religious views, the world in turn charges the gospel with being a subversive and licentious doctrine, offensive to God and man, a doctrine to be persecuted as the worst plague on earth. Too often we look at the simple gospel and we think, that's too easy. There's got to be something more to it. And then we begin to add things to it, requirements, and things that people do. The problem is, is that once you start to add steps, people will take the steps without the relationship. Because we love to earn our own way. Especially in America, I mean, we love to say things like, I pull myself up by my bootstraps and I I earned my living. Look at the things I've accomplished in my life. We point to the merits of the things that we have done. In churches, we can do the same thing. We, we point to both our traditional things, but we can also point to things like a building and think, look at what we have done. We have to be careful <coughs> that we don't turn our accomplishments into our religion, our steps into the way to reach Christ, that they must follow in the exact footsteps that I do. It's always amazing to me as I witness to people, as I talk to people, how many people's stories are different than mine. There are a lot of similarities in the way people come to Christ, but there are a lot of differences too. One of the great things about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it unites people of different backgrounds, different faiths, different races, different uh, ethnicities, different upbringings, everything. And the great thing to me about Christ is, is that I can sit across the table from someone I have a, it may be a political or social disagreement with, and Christ is great enough that He unites us anyway. That He's bigger than those divisional things. We certainly have learned over the course of the last two or three years that that's become more and more difficult for churches. And a lot of that is because we were separated for a period of time. And when we're around one another a lot, we, we tend to become much more gracious towards one another. And as soon as we begin to separate, we begin to kind of become our own echo chamber. We're hearing only our own thoughts, and we become less tolerant of other people. It's one of the reasons why we're told in Hebrews not to forsake the gathering together of yourselves. Because when we're around one another, we tend to be more gracious to one another. So it's important that we remember that this gospel can be offensive sometimes because it challenges social viewpoints. It challenges political viewpoints. It challenges traditional religious viewpoints. So we need to be aware that it's going to do that. And he's trying to help us understand our freedom in Christ. That it's not a licentious doctrine. And by that it just means you don't have a license to sin. Grace did not come to cover your sin. It came to free you from your sin. When it says covering, it just simply means that you're covered under Christ, but it doesn't mean that you are free to continue to sin below grace. That's why Paul says, do we say you should sin more so grace can abound more? No, by no means do we say that. It's not licentious because what we are actually free to do is free to pursue Him. You were already free to pursue sin. But you didn't. You couldn't pursue Him without the Holy Spirit in your life. 
So here we are in chapter 6, end of the book. It's really kind of broken up into three sections, I feel like. That's why we we're going to do it in one, one message. And we're going to talk about three, I believe, kind of pictures that we see uh, in this chapter 6. Okay, so we're going to talk about the flock. We'll develop that here in a minute. We're going to talk about the helper. And we're going to talk about the heavy. And you'll see what I mean as we get into that and kind of break it down. But I'm going to pray for us. We'll read these verses, and then we'll uh, cover chapter 6. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity today to be here uh, worshiping you. I pray, Lord, that not only do we understand properly your message today, but its implication for our lives. Help us, Lord, to see more clearly who we are, who you are, and what it is that we need to be championing. What's, what is it that we're glorifying about you and who you are? Help us, Lord, to understand that when we leave here today, while we enter the mission field, the people around us, Lord, that you have sent us here to minister to, I pray, Lord, that this message is something that helps us engage them better. I pray, Lord, that it corrects us inside the walls of this church if there are things that we need to change. And Lord, I pray that it prepares us as individual disciples to reflect you more and more. Be with us as we study this passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So chapter 6 reads like this, 18 verses. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load." Let the one who is taught the word share all things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither the circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. So when we read these verses, it's a lot, it's a chunk. But I think there are three kind of distinct pictures that we see here, and they're especially of, of people that we come in contact with on a pretty regular basis. Me as a pastor and in you as believers and as a congregation. The first is the flock. Now we see this uh, just as being all of us. I mean, we all have an aspect where we can be caught in a transgression. It says that in 6 1, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. I want you to understand that when it says caught in any transgression, that doesn't mean like they were doing something and suddenly it came to light. What it means is more like in a trap, like you were caught in a transgression. Sin grabs a hold of you. You are suddenly caught in something that you can't seem to escape on your own. 
And as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are prone to do so. We all have times where we sin in ways that we didn't intend to. We suddenly are caught in a sin or caught up in some kind of sinful behavior. And we need others to help us to get out of that. It's part of the reason why we belong to a church. It's so that people can come alongside of us when we're struggling in not only trials in our lives, but even sin in our lives and be able to help us move forward. That's the flock. We're going to stumble. The flock is needy. We are. We're needy people as believers. I mean, it's just a part of it. I mean, we should accept it right off the bat. We are needy people. That's just part of being sheep. It's a part of being the flock of God. We can't do it on our own. And every time we try to do it all on our own, we fail. So we need the flock. That flock aspect that's there isn't something to condemn, it's something to rally around. <clears throat> and that's why I say it the way I do. Because the more we have it in our mind that we're going to do that, that we're going to stumble, that we're going to fall, the better off we're going to be. And that's why it says keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Because as members of the flock, we are prone to sin as well. And when we're trying to help someone else out, be sure that we're not falling into the same sin or some sin equal. Fun fact for you, if sheep have a unique rectangular pupil that allows them a certain amazing peripheral vision, it's estimated that their field of vision is between 270 and 320 degrees. Humans, in comparison, have 155 degrees. What that means is, is that even sheep can see trouble coming better than we can. So the fact that we're the flock, we should understand these things are going to happen. Trouble is going to come. And when it does, we shouldn't just run away from our brother or sister in Christ because they've been caught in a transgression. We who are spiritual need to work to restore them, to get them back into a place of right fellowship and right standing before God, which kind of leads us to this next group, well, the helper. Well, when you look at Galatians 2, uh, 6, 2, and 3, it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. This is the person, this helper is the person who's always trying to help you lift the weight you are carrying. And we're supposed to all be that way. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens that way. We see someone struggling under a yoke, we're supposed to step into the yoke and help them lift that burden. I can tell you as a pastor, I am extremely grateful for helpful helpers in the church. People that come along, see the weight that you're carrying as a leader and attempt to help you lift that weight. And as believers, we need those people too. Maybe you have those people in your life already, and if you don't, you need to find some of those people that are in the congregation that are helpers. They're going to help you lift the weight that you're bearing. We're all supposed to be doing that. And then you have the third category of people, which would be the heavy I know it's not really good grammar to call somebody the heavy, but, but it is a good descriptor. In Galatians, it says this in 4 through 8, But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not, deceive, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In this passage, you have this picture of some people that are tending to compare themselves to everyone else. And what they really like to do is point out the things you're doing wrong so it helps them to look better. They take the weight you're carrying and push down on it. They make it heavier. 
harder to carry. No restoration in them. No help is coming from them. They are attempting to push down on the weight you're carrying, and if they can possibly make it harder for you, they will. And sometimes that's because while they're pushing you down, it elevates them. But they should be warned that God is not deceived. You will reap what you sow. So we don't want to be the heavy. We don't want to be that person. We don't want to be the person that's always adding to what people have to deal with already. The simple gospel that we have is such a prize to be able to offer to the world around us. But instead, sometimes we offer it as the flock, which is good, and we say things like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and you can be a sinner saved by grace, which is true. But then we begin to treat them as if they're believers already and forgive every sin they've ever done, but they've not become a member of the household of faith. And particularly in the world we live in today, that's what they want. They, the world wants us to forgive all sin without any repentance, without any turning from their sin, without any acceptance of Jesus Christ. So as a member of the flock, we need to remember that some of these things we talk about inside the, the church are for the family of God. And we need to be sure that when we present them to other people, that our first step is to help them become a member of the flock, not to immediately experience all forgiveness and acceptance of sin. Then we have the helping aspect, which is a wonderful part of what we do, and we can talk about how our church helps us to carry the load that we are bearing. And when we do, it becomes an attractive thing for people outside of the flock. And I'm afraid too often that what they hear about is the heavy, the ed added requirements, the additional weight, the judgment or something like it that takes whatever burden they're trying to carry and pushes down on it. As a pastor, you get to experience all three types of people in the congregation. And you certainly get to experience it outside the congregation. We need to determine and think about and pray through what it is that we want to reflect. <clears throat> we should want to reflect the fact that we're a part of the flock of God. We should want to reflect being a helper and coming along and helping to bear one another's burdens. We should seek to rid ourselves of being the heavy, finding ways to add to people's weight. And there is actually a fourth category in this verse that I want to talk about, and it's the extorter. 9 through 18 reads like this, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We talked about that a moment ago in the flock and being a helper. And then he changes tone. And he says it even, I mean, you can picture he even writes it in big letters. He's trying to say something. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So he begins to talk about an extorter, someone who wants to use you to make themselves look better, someone who wants to use you to escape persecution on their own. Someone who wants to make much of themselves while making little of you. We talked about that earlier in Galatians. Thirteen, for even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they might boast in your flesh. 
You've probably seen it, I know I have, where a leader in a church, a pastor, maybe gets excited about the fact that he makes his church do certain things, and he can brag about the obedience of his church because they do certain things. Like maybe you know, walk a certain way, say a certain thing, dress a certain way. They can boast in your flesh while they themselves struggle with sin, while they themselves are a part of the flock, while they need helpers. But they extort your behavior so they can make themselves look better, and sometimes to escape persecution. Because rather than to be questioned about the cause of Christ, they can brag in the flesh the accomplishments that they've achieved. But far be it from me, Paul says, to boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And we know what he means by that, right? Because he tells us in Corinthians, the old has passed away and the new has come. That's what matters, that we're new creations in Christ, not whether we've been circumcised or not, or whether we follow all of the Jewish law. It's again back to the simple gospel. Do you know Jesus Christ? Is He the Lord of your life? And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. So which do you think you are? Are you a member of the flock? Are you a helper in that flock? Are you a heavy? Are you an extorter? I think there are moments where we always have to come back, pray through, think through what behaviors are dominating our lives at this time. It's part of the reason why I would highly encourage, if you don't already, make sure you're spending daily time in the Word in some way, whether that's through a devotional, a reading plan, whatever it is, because you will see things that the Word of God will bring to your mind that you need to relearn or you need to remember or you need to be repentant of, or you need to change. Every lost person in this city needs to meet the flock. They all need to meet a helper. None of them wants to meet the heavy or the extorter. When we really understand the simplicity of the gospel and the freedom we have in Christ, it should produce in us a heart much more like the flock and the helper and much less like the heavy or the extorter. Because in the end, neither circumcision counts for anything or non-circumcision, but a new creation. In the end, we have to realize that He has set us free and we have a message that can set them free. And let's make sure that's the message that we're giving them.